In this video, I'm gonna tell you everything you've been wanting to know about Axis deer. Where they're from, what they eat, and for those of you in Texas, I'm gonna cover how they got here, when they got here, and more importantly, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how they compete with our native white-tailed deer. Welcome to Landowner TV, where I make you smarter about your land, one video at a time. On this channel, I cover topics that landowners frequently have questions about. Topics like wildlife management, livestock, and I'll even cover topics like water law and easements. If there's a particular topic that you want to learn more about, go in the comments below and type it in and I'll try to get to it as soon as I can. So if you're a landowner or just someone who generally enjoys learning about land, be sure to subscribe to this channel and go ahead and hit that little bell icon. That way you're notified every time I upload a new video. So let's jump straight into it. Axis deer are originally from India and Sri Lanka. Their native range extends from the foothills of the Himalayas all the way to the southern tip of India. It's a huge area, but it's actually got a similar climate to the climate here in Texas, which is temperate. And that helps explain why their feral populations are doing so well. Now over there, they're often referred to as Chital or Chital or I don't know what I'm supposed to say here, but it's actually the native word for spotted deer, which makes sense clearly. They're often referred to as one of the most beautiful deer species. And it's easy to see why. I mean, they look like big whitetail fawns. And who doesn't like whitetail fawns? Hmm? Bucks will weigh up to 200 pounds plus. They'll typically sport about six points. Like this guy here. I found that skull just like that, bleached on a ranch in Junction, Texas. But some bucks will have up to eight, even 10 points in some cases. And they'll have kickers off the side or drop tines and they can really make for some impressive antlers. Does, however, are much smaller, usually around 110 to 135 pounds, which is just slightly larger than an average white-tailed doe. Now, axes are far more active by day than by night. In fact, their activity peaks in the hours post-dawn and pre-dusk. Now, for, for wildlife enthusiasts, you, you know this as being crepuscular. So although they are active 24 hours a day, that's when their activity tends to peak. And although axis deer occupy rough terrain in both Texas and in India, on a localized measure, they tend to prefer to hang out around flat areas rather than the steep hillsides. Their basic family group consists of older does and their offspring. Herds can consist of several family groups and vary in size from just a few animals to several hundred animals in a herd. Now let's talk about the home range of an axis deer. Home range is defined by the area that a group of animals will travel on a regular basis to find food, water, mates, etc. And for axis deer, that area seems to be around 1,500 acres. And this applies to both bucks and to does. In the areas where their range overlaps in Texas, white-tailed bucks' home range varies from about 1,500 acres to about 3,300 acres. And the white-tailed does go from about 330 to about 900 acres, which is much less than the axis deer. Axis deer exhibit social behavior much more like elk than like white-tailed deer, where adults and young males will actively participate in the social structure of the herd whereas white-tailed deer will often remain distant when they reach maturity. Axis bucks will also bugle and bellow similar to elk when they're in the rut. So axis deer produce year-round. In matter of fact, hunters find it really rare to harvest a doe that's not either pregnant or lactating. Although in Texas, most of this breeding occurs during the summertime and most fawn production happens in the spring. According to some research done by Texas Tech, 80% of fawns are born between January and April of every year. They have a seven and a half month gestation period and with their constant breeding, they typically will have four fawns in three years. Now, within a herd, bucks can be found year round with hard antlers. Although individual bucks will develop antlers and shed them just like whitetail. But in a herd, there seems to be no trend overall when, when they're hard and when they're not. It's thought that each buck maintains its own reproductive cycle and will rut soon after its antlers are hard, regardless of the time of year that happens. Individual does also maintain their own independent reproductive cycle. And at any given time, a large herd should have several does coming into estrus. They were first actually introduced to the United States in the 1860s, and it's not to where you think. They were first brought into Hawaii of all places as a gift to the Hawaiian king from Hong Kong. Now the first introduction to Texas was actually into South Texas, and this was done in the 1930s, and axis deer were brought in alongside several other exotic undulates, including black buck antelope, fallow, cyca, even a nilgai. And they were brought in as a game species for additional hunting options. And after a period of time, many of those were bought by other ranches and transported back and forth. Over time, those animals begin to escape and in many cases create their own feral population. Now, just in case you don't know, a feral species is a non-native species to an area that's able to come in and create viable populations. Good example of this, feral hogs. 
So if Axis now, as well as a lot of these other exotic undulates, are clearly feral in Texas, as private landowners across state uh, who had nothing to do with bringing them in are seeing them on their place, specifically in the hill country. By 1988, studies indicate that Axis deer had viable populations in 27 counties in Texas. And most of these counties were in Central and South Texas. Fast forward to today, they have known viable populations in 92 counties in Texas and they have an estimated population of around 125,000 animals. Now this is according to the Exotic Wildlife Association. Now their highest population density is around the Edwards Plateau and the beautiful Texas Hill Country. And this is part of the state that seems to be most representative of their native climate. The difficult thing about creating a video and writing an article like I did on landassociation.org, go check it out, links in the description below, is it's really hard to find, like I mentioned before, it's really hard to find good information around the axis deer. I mean, there's a lot of anecdotal information out there by a blogger or some, or some reporter, but to find the true data around scientific research was pretty tough. Even Texas Tech, who seems to do the most research around this as far as I can tell, provided on, on some of their sites just anecdotal information about axis being the most abundant exotic undulate in Texas, but not really giving you real data around how many there were or any base or, or any population density information. So we may not know the exact number of axis deer in, in the state or in the hill country, but anyone driving through the hill country can certainly believe in their population and the fact that it's growing. And it's, it's clear that they're seeing continued success on the whitetails native range here in Texas. In fact, we know in some areas that axis deer are actually beginning to outnumber whitetail deer. The Hill Country Alliance recently published an article around survey data performed in Gillespie County. This was done by the Cade Creek Wildlife Management Area. And if you're wondering which area, think Fredericksburg. Their survey results came back with 347 whitetail and 546 axis. Dang! So this study certainly outlines some of the fears that some wildlife biologists have that axis deer are beginning to outcompete our native whitetail in their home range. So it's clear they do compete, but this is not a competition that's physical, right? They're not beating them up. It's a competition for resources. So how does this work? So axis deer are grazers and browsers. Remember, whitetail deer are predominantly browsers. Axis will eat grass, forbs, browse, uh, and mast when it's available, just like whitetail will. But according to a lot of recent studies, axis will shift their diets almost completely to grass when forbs, browse, mast isn't available. And I'm going to get into that in a second. Okay, so they eat the same plants as whitetail. Now it comes down to a simple math equation. The land is only producing a certain amount of groceries at a time, which can only support a given amount of grazers. The quantity of grazers that land can support at any given time it's known as its carrying capacity. And every, every region or square unit of land has a certain carrying capacity of grazers just by based on the amount of vegetation it produces. So it's a zero sum game. The more axes are eating, the less is available to whitetail. So understanding this overlap and this grazing dynamic, the Texas Parks and Wildlife decided to conduct a trial study between how whitetail deer competed with several different species of exotic animals. They did this at the Kerr Wildlife Management Area and to do this, they separated out six 96 acre pens. All grazers were removed and then they were restocked with six whitetail and six individuals of another species, three bucks and three does. And one pen had whitetail and axis, one had whitetail and fallow, one had whitetail and cyca. I actually don't know what the other three had. Then what they did over time was with no inputs into those, they monitored the population just to see what would happen over time. Good news, I've got those results for you right here. Actually right there. By the way, I know we're talking about a lot of subjects. I know this is a video, so sometimes it's hard to retain this. Understand that I've written a full article that covers all of this information, and it's online at landassociation.org. That's the Texas Landowner Association official website. Go check it out because there's information around axis deer, whitetail diets, all kinds of information that you should find helpful as a landowner or someone just generally interested in land. Initially, after putting six individuals from each species in that 96 acre pen, both populations increased. This indicates to me that 96 acres in the Kerr Wildlife Management Area can support naturally more than 12 deer. But look what happens over time. After the initial bump in population, whitetail level off pretty evenly, whereas axis continue to grow to have, over 20, to have over 20 individuals in that pen. Meanwhile, whitetail have less than half. Fast forward to the end of the study, there's only a couple whitetail in the pen and, and, and 16 axis. So why did this happen? Why after eight simple years were there almost no whitetail left while there's axis? Hmm? If they both eat the same things, why are the whitetail the ones dying off? The answer is simple, especially if you read my article around whitetail diets. And although whitetail will eat grass, 
they're not efficient at digesting grass. In fact, it's famously stated that a whitetail can die of starvation with a belly full of grass. But guess what? Axis can. Axis, in fact, will live off diets that are mostly composed of grass. So what happens? They go into the pen, they knock out all the preferred species of forbs and browse. Guess what? Axis turn to grass, so do the whitetail, but unfortunately they can't digest as efficiently, so axis persists, whitetail will not. So when you look at the hill country in general, there's a, whitetail are at a big disadvantage in areas where there's overlap with axis populations because they simply can't compete with them while axis are getting extra groceries. And this problem is exacerbated during times of drought when there are just fewer groceries available in general. Now I'm not trying to be an alarmist saying that axis are going to be taking over the hill country, but it does help explain the rise in their population and in the case of the Cave Creek survey, it explains some of those results. By the way, just for your reference, if, here's the data from the Psyca pen where there were six whitetail and six Psyca. Check this out. It's even more dramatic than the axis pen. Back to axis though. Okay, so let's talk about axis hunting, which I know a ton of you want to hear about. I would actually claim that axis deer are the most popular exotic ungulate to hunt in the state of Texas. So discounting whitetail deer, I would say that of the, of the exotic deer species, they're probably the number one target. In fact, I would say in terms of feral species, they're actually the really number two target statewide. Second really only to feral hogs. But let's do a quick population comparison real fast. 3.6 million whitetail, 2.6 million feral hogs, 125,000 estimated axis. So even given that, axes are pretty popular. And look, they're popular for a number of reasons. Number one, they're beautiful animals. Their hides can be tanned. People make pillows. They make artwork out of their antlers. Uh, they're, they're a really great mount if you're into that kind of thing. And by the way, they have amazing meat. When it comes to venison, I actually prefer axis meat over whitetail meat almost any day. But that's my personal preference. Feel free to slam me in the comments. But since axis deer aren't indigenous to Texas, there's no season. But you do need a Texas hunting license to hunt them. Since axis deer aren't native to Texas, they're actually not considered a game species. They're actually considered livestock, just like a cattle. So you can buy them and you can sell them. Now you do have to have a hunting license to harvest an axis deer. And you can't hunt them out of a public roadway. And obviously you're going to need a landowner's permission to hunt on their property. But having these species available on a ranch gives a commercial hunting operation a lot more options to bring people out on a year-round basis rather than having such a cyclical business around bringing hunters in just when whitetail can be harvested. So for that reason, a lot of game ranches have many exotic species, including axis, providing year-round hunting options uh, for their hunters. So how much does it cost to hunt an axis? I did a lot of research around this. I actually made a chart of around 50 commercial ranches, ranking them from the cheapest place to harvest a buck to the most expensive. And here's what I found out. It's not about the axis buck. It's about the accommodations. The nicer the hunting lodge, the more options there are around a hunting lodge, the more expensive the axes are going to be. It costs between $1,750 to $5,500 to harvest an axis buck. And some ranches will include a couple nights lodging, and some ranches will even include the harvesting of a doe if you just decide to purchase that buck. Fees for lodging can range, once again, depending on the lodge, between $200 a day all the way to $600 to $800 a day. These charges typically include three hot meals, food, uh, other snacks, and obviously alcohol. Now, when I narrowed it down to a 32-inch buck or better, I saw variability in ranches between $2,200 and $3,750 for that 32-inch buck. And once again, just depends on how nice the facility is. Now, if you want to harvest a trophy, a trophy for an axis is typically considered uh, over 35 inches. And many will have drop times or eight or more points. And the current record axis was harvested in India, had beams of 41 inches. Dang! That's big! That's 32 inches. Now, when I'm talking about inches, I'm talking about beam length. So, the length of those beams. All right. Last thing, I'm going to tell you about buying axis at an auction or just buying axis to bring back to your ranch. Now you got three options when you want to buy a live axe. You can go to a, a wildlife auction. There's a couple of them across the state. There's Raz Livestock Auction, Huntsville Livestock Auction, and I'm sure there's others that I just don't know about. But I recently attended an auction, I won't tell you which one, and they were running axis deer through there in lots of four to eight, and the does were going for between three and four hundred dollars uh, per doe. And young bucks and spikes were running between 250 to 450 bucks, and they were also going in lots. And sometimes they were priced in with the does, because they run these things through. You bid on them, and then you run them out, and then they put them in these pens, and you go put them in your trailer, and then you take them back to the ranch. And when they had better sized bucks, like 28 inches plus, they were going between 1,100 and 1,800 dollars. So you can see the business of a commercial hunting. You go buy them at these auctions, and you put them out in your place. They then go reproduce and then they, you charge access to your ranch and they're harvested. One unfortunate thing about access deer though is they're very susceptible to something called white muscle disease, 
when they get too stressed out, their muscles will lock up and ultimately, and a lot of them will end up dying. And for this reason, it's most helpful to get them trapped once and take them directly where you want to go. Transporting axes generally is just not a good idea. It's not good for them. Listen, I really enjoyed creating this video. I hope you took something out of it. Like I said, if you, if you want more information around Axis Deer, go to landassociation.org. It's the official website of the Texas Landowners Association. I put articles about this stuff up there all the time. Go check it out. And look, put, it, put it in the comments below. Tell me what you think. Tell me what I can do better. Look forward to hearing from you. See you on the next video.